Hello, it's Scott Manley here. A couple of weeks ago, I made a video about NASA's ArcJet test facility at NASA Ames, and many of you noticed its similarities to a rocket engine. It was producing a high temperature gas, passing it through a nozzle, which would accelerate it to many times the speed of sound. So many of you asked, could you actually use that as an engine? And well, yes, in theory you could, but moreover, this ArcJet technology has actually been employed on spacecraft already, albeit at a much smaller scale. There is a whole family of thrusters called electrothermal thrusters, which I've not really talked about until now. Now, this is distinct from electric propulsion, where you have electromagnetic fields that are used to accelerate ionized particles to a very high velocities, and they get really high specific impulses. This is much closer to a nuclear thermal thruster where the propellant is heated, but instead of using a nuclear reaction, you're using electricity directly. So heating a propellant before exhausting it will increase the exhaust velocity and that'll improve the specific impulse. And this has the advantage that uh, you don't need to have highly reactive chemicals uh, as a propellant. You can use something inert like, say, hydrogen or something common like water or even waste water or waste products from humans. And we'll talk about that later. But equally, you can also use this as an extra step if you're, say, using a conventional chemical thruster and you want to make the exhaust hotter still. So the performance of any thermal thruster is proportional to the square root of the temperature. So if you have a cold gas thruster that is, say, uh, exhausting gas at room temperature, say 300 Kelvin, and then you heat that up to 600 Kelvin, well, that will increase the specific impulse by the square root of two. You know, 600 divided by three is two, take the square root of two and you get like 41%. So you can get a decent performance upgrade with a relatively small temperature increase. Now, if you raise up to 900 uh, Kelvin, that's a 73% improvement. 1200, that would give you 100% improvement. You see how this works? So the oldest concept of an electrothermal thruster is the resistojet. And it's like a conventional cold gas thruster, but instead of uh, just exhausting the gas out of a nozzle, you have a heater in there. It's like an, a heating element that you might have in say a hairdryer. You're basically heating your gas up and because it's hotter, it will emerge the nozzle at higher speeds and therefore perform, get you higher specific impulse in exchange for uh, expanding electrical power to do this. But of course, raising the temperature of gas takes a lot of energy. So if it's say powered by solar panels, it's maybe generating very low flow rates so that the small amount of gas flow that's going through there is being raised to a sufficiently high temperature by the very small amount of electrical power you might have. If you then have a low power input, there's also other designs which you can accumulate and store thermal energy in basically a big brick, right? So you can make your heating element something that is, has a fair amount of mass in it, and then you slowly bring that up to temperature, and then every time you blow stuff over it, it cools down and comes back up to temperature. So that's another way where you can store thermal energy for a pulse thruster. The point is though, these things tend to be low thrust things that are used uh, in a pulsed fashion or very slowly. So resistor jets can cover a range. At the low end of the scale, if you don't use fancy exotic materials on your heating element, you can take a rather mundane cold gas thruster and basically turbocharge it up to you know twice its performance. If you use high end you know, expensive exotic materials for your element that can handle thousands of Kelvin, you can take a chemical thruster and make it more performant than most chemical thrusters because it can, you know, you're generating extra heat. So the, you know, resistor jets, they go back to the 1960s. They're still being tested and developed today for, you know, small satellites, niche applications. One example I found uh, was from a satellite called UASAT-12 and they talk about a, it was a 250 kilogram satellite and it included a resistor jet thruster on board that they tested. It used 90 watts of power and nitrous oxide as the propellant and its thrust was about 93 millinewtons. So that's about you know 10 grams of force roughly. 
So they also, by the way, tested this using nitrogen and water on the ground, but they tested it in space with nitrous oxide. Now, it also had a traditional cold gas system, which used nitrogen, and that system had actually more delta V, about 60% more delta V, but it needed three times the propellant mass. So actually, they were getting twice the performance out of this nitrous oxide system for pound per pound of the propellant. For example, right, so the cold gas system got um, about 60 seconds of impulse, whereas the resistor jet system was more like 130. At the same paper, they also talk about another uh, resistor jet they developed, which was 15 watt thruster using butane, and there was another one which used water. So the resistor jet's ability to use low cost propellants is a hugely attractive advantage over hydrazine. Hydrazine isn't that expensive, but it's expensive to work with because it's so toxic, it's so corrosive, you need people to like load it using you know, fancy uh, suits with, that will protect them and make sure they don't accidentally breathe it. It's also toxic, by the way. Yeah, but if you really want to use hydrazine because you know maybe you're Nile Red, then there is such a thing as the hydrazine resistor jet, right? So normally, Hydrazine thrusters, the monopropellant version, you pass the hydrazine over a catalyst and it decomposes into hydrogen, nitrogen, and maybe some ammonia. And this raises the temperature to about 1300 Kelvin. It's an exothermic reaction. And this gives you about 200 seconds of specific impulse. So that's nice, but it's not amazingly efficient, but it is nice because it's a single monopropellant. Now, if you then take that hot gas and then pass it over a resistor jet and raise the temperature to maybe 3000 Kelvin, then your performance goes up to about 300 seconds. And that's comparable to the bipropellant hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide system, right? But with half the number of hideously toxic chemicals. And so a fine example of this is the MR501 series of thrusters by Aerojet. These have been in operation for a fairly amount of, long amount of time. These are used in geostationary satellites. They have been flown on a number of air spacecraft. They consume about a kilowatt of power and they generate thrust of about 800 millinewtons. So that's about 80 grams of force. And on paper, a resistor jet can even exceed the performance of common chemical engines at least in theory, if you use the right propellants such as hydrogen, you can get about 800 seconds of performance, making it as efficient as a nuclear thruster, but without the radiation, and you can make it smaller and lower thrust. Ammonia is another example. If you heat that enough, you get about 400 seconds of specific impulse, which makes it better than most chemical systems, except perhaps you know hydrogen and oxygen, which is of course highly cryogenic and difficult to handle, you're compared to ammonia. And you know, since it can work with almost any propellant, it can be made to work with waste, like specifically leftover gases from human metabolism, right? You're keeping humans alive, you're putting in oxygen and sugars and food and stuff like that, and you're getting out carbon dioxide, you're getting out water, you're getting out methane, right? And they can all all be used in electrothermal thrusters, which don't really care what you put into them as long as you're putting enough into them to stop the element from overheating. So during the early days, well actually during quite a lot of the development of space station freedom, there were a lot of studies as to whether they could use resistor jet propulsion to keep the station in orbit, essentially using the waste products from the astronauts who were living on the station. That's not what we have today. We have much better closed cycle um, you know, life support systems, but back then this was seriously considered. And by the way, uh, at, when you're talking about these high-end hydrazine thrusters, I, I, I talked that the exhaust temperature, you were trying to get up to about 3000 Kelvin. That means your heating element is round about that temperature. It's slightly hotter. And that's comparable to the temperatures of the filament in an incandescent light bulb. So the heating element is glowing white hot. And to remain, you know, not melted, it has to be made of some pretty exotic materials, you know, like tungsten, molybdenum, that kind of thing. You can have various ceramics. But it is glowing white hot to try to you know, heat up this already hot gas to even higher temperatures. So if you do want to go hotter than that, 
then you need to somehow find either a heating element that can handle that or get rid of the heating element entirely. And that is where arc jets come in. So arc jets basically get rid of the heating element and they heat the gas by passing an electric arc through the gas, a lightning bolt. They contain a lightning bolt inside an engine and it jumps around. They have various uh, you know, conditioning systems. They'll set up like a propellant vortex apparently, which helps keep the lightning bolts under control. It's jumping through the nozzle and it's heating the propellant as it's expelling. Now this uncaps the temperature you can reach. You can get to extraordinarily high temperatures. I've heard as much as like 20,000 Kelvin for some tests. That's many times hotter than the surface of the sun. Now, granted that may be a point that is that hot and then the temperature spreads throughout the, the fluid, but you know, peak temperatures of some of these things can be extraordinarily high. Now the arc jet facility I showed at NASA was using 60 megawatts of power to heat that gas. While the small thrusters that we're talking about for spacecraft, those are more likely to use you know, a couple of kilowatts of power. You know, so these have been used on hundreds of satellites. They are the, the MR500, 509 I think is one. And when you use with the hydrazine, they heat them up sufficiently that they're getting about 500 seconds of impulse. So that's not bad. That's like, you know, nine, 10,000 degrees uh, Kelvin, I think, easily. That is, uh, the thrust for that is about 200 millinewtons. It's about 20 grams of force. So you see that we've increased the power, we've dropped the thrust, but we've increased the specific impulse. So yeah, this is a pretty common piece of hardware that you can buy off the shelf. They do tend to be heavier than resistor jets as well. So you have to decide when you're building your spacecraft, how much you know mass you want to devote, devote to hardware versus how much you devote to the propellant. And there are, depending upon your application, your lifetime, your satellite mass, there may be cases where you want to stick with a simpler lower mass resistor jet and accept the lower performance. And for other ones, you may want the bigger, heavier thruster and the more efficient fuel usage. These are just the kind of decisions you have to make. Now, like resistor jets, you can also use arc jets with propellants like hydrogen or ammonia. And again, you will get better specific impulse if you're prepared to expend the extra electrical power. In 1999, there was a spacecraft carrying an experiment called the Electric Propulsion Space Experiment. And that was a 30 kilowatt ammonia arc jet that was tested in space. And it generated two kilonewtons of thrust and it got a 800 seconds of specific impulse, which is comparable to a Nerva style engine in terms of specific impulse, but it didn't need to have a nuclear reactor on board. However, to get 30 kilowatts of power, they would have needed very large solar panels. They didn't have those. Instead, they had a battery bank, which they would charge up slowly, and then they could fire the thruster for like 10, 15 minutes and slowly verify and test that it actually worked. But arc thrusters do tend to have a limited life because that electric arc is jumping around and where it's hitting the electrode, if it stays there too long, it slowly damages it. And over time, everything gets degraded and eventually things fail. So wouldn't it be great if you could heat up the propellant without having electrodes in contact with it? And guess what? There is something called the induction thruster and this uses uh, oscillating electromagnetic fields inside a cavity to heat your propellant. This is what we call radio waves or microwaves. I mean, this is literally, you know, there's a version that, which is very similar to a microwave uh, and it's basically creating a hot spot in the middle. If you think about it, the gas, uh, it may be something like water, which has, you know, slightly polarized molecules. And if you're hitting it with an oscillating magnetic field, then you're actually heating up that water, you're causing it to twist. And eventually it gets hot enough that the atoms start, or the molecules start banging into each other and knocking electrons off, and then you have plasma. And the plasma is even easier to heat. So once you get it running, you can start dumping more propellant in and you can start heating it. And you basically have an electrodeless electrothermal thruster.
Now, they might think that without the prospect of electrode erosion, this means they can make it hotter still and get better efficiency. But really, that doesn't tend to happen. You still have to deal with throat erosion, nozzle erosion. These plasma generators are, of course, used as the first stage for plasma thrusters and electrostatic thrusters. But that is an entirely different subject. We'll talk about that some other time. But there is actually a company called Momentous Space, and they build a ferry, like a space tug, and they've been demonstrating a microwave electrothermal thruster that uses distilled water as a propellant. And according to the details that they've given, it's generating 800 millinewtons and 650 seconds of specific impulse. We don't know how much power it uses, but it probably is on the order of you know several, a few kilowatts. You know, we figure out the amount, given the exhaust velocity, that has to be at least about, you know, three kilowatts, more likely around five, but that is a complete guess. But yeah, this is it. You're basically heating up water in a chamber and then having that exhaust out at very high temperatures and you're getting better performance than you would using a chemical engine. 650 seconds, that is better than the space shuttle's engines, but of course, 800 millinewtons is, you know, 80 grams of thrust, right? <laughs> 80 grams of force. So yeah, the, I mean, the thing is, yeah, this type of electrodeless heating, it does find that it tends to get used in um, traditional electrostatic thrusters like gridded ion thrusters or Hall effect thrusters. And that really brings us to the point that these electrothermal thrusters they have a small niche where they sort of make sense. For many missions, it's now becoming much cheaper and more common to use Hall effect thrusters, which while they do need more exotic propellants like argon or krypton or xenon, the, for the electrical power that you're putting in, you're getting much better specific impulse, lower thrust, of course, but for the mission requirements, the, the specific impulse is really what is driving this decision. And so we've seen a lot fewer electro, you know, electrothermal systems over time as uh, the electrostatic stuff comes out. So yeah, that is the small niche that is electrothermal propulsion systems. They do actually get used both as resistor jets and arc jets, and they are attractive if you want to be able to use propellants on your spacecraft when you're not allowed to use you know, any more interesting propellants that could actually burn or poison people. So there's a totally valid use on small CubeSats. Uh, the performance can be made higher if you have a lot of power. Resistor jets, by the way, they only really make sense if you're gonna be powering with a, a solar electric system. If you have a nuclear electric system, then you might as well use your reactor core to heat the propellant directly and then you've not got any electrical you know, losses, electrical efficiency conversion losses there, right? Um, the arc jet, on the other hand, yes, you can still take advantage of slightly higher performance, but if you've got that much power available, hey, why don't you start looking at cooler things like Vasimir, which is, yeah, it's a bit like an inductive heating system, but it has some other bells and whistles, and I'll really have to talk about it sometime. So yeah, do you guys use electrothermal thrusters? It'd be really interesting to know. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. <music>